landing 12 people on the moon remains one of NASA's greatest achievements, if not the greatest. Astronauts collected rocks, took photos, performed experiments, planted flags, and then came home. But those who stayed during the Apollo program didn't establish a lasting human presence on the moon. 50 years after the most recent crewed moon landing, Apollo 17 in 1972, there are plenty of reasons to return people to Earth's giant dusty satellite and stay there. NASA has promised that we will see U.S. astronauts on the moon again soonish, maybe by 2025 at the earliest. In a program called Artemis, which will include the first women to ever touch the lunar surface, former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, who ran the agency during Trump administration, said it's not science or technology hurdles that have held the U.S. back from doing this sooner. If it wasn't for the political risk, we wouldn't be on the moon right now, Bridenstine said on a phone call with reporters in 2018. In fact, we would probably be on Mars. So why haven't astronauts been back to the moon in 50 years? It was the political risks that prevented it from happening, Bridenstine said. The program took too long and it costs too much money. Researchers and entrepreneurs have long pushed for the creation of a crude base on the moon, a lunar base station. A permanent human research station on the moon is the next logical step. It's only three days away. We can afford to get it wrong and not kill everybody. Chris Hadfield, a former astronaut, previously told Business Insider. And we have a whole bunch of stuff we have to invent and then test in order to learn before we can go deeper out. A lunar base could evolve into a fuel depot for deep space missions, lead to the creation of unprecedented space telescopes, make it easier to live on Mars, and solve long-standing scientific mysteries about Earth and the Moon's creation. It could even spur a thriving off-world economy, perhaps one built around lunar space tourism. But many astronauts and other experts suggest the biggest impediments to making new crewed moon missions a reality are banal and somewhat depressing. A tried and true hurdle for any spaceflight program, especially missions that involve people, is the steep cost. NASA's 2022 budget is $24 billion, and the Biden administration is asking Congress to boost that to nearly $26 billion in the 2023 budget. Those amounts may seem like a windfall until you consider that the total gets split among all the agency's divisions and ambitious projects, like the James Webb Space Telescope, the giant rocket project called Space Launch System, or SLS, and far-flung missions to the Sun, Jupiter, Mars, the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt, and the edge of the solar system. By contrast, the U.S. military is on track for a budget of about $858 billion in 2023. Plus, NASA's budget is somewhat small relative to its past. NASA's portion of the federal budget peaked at 4% in 1965. Apollo 7 astronaut Walter Cunningham said during congressional testimony in 2015, For the past 40 years, it has remained below 1%, and for the last 15 years, it has been driving towards 0.4% of the federal budget. A 2005 report by NASA estimated that returning to the moon would cost about $104 billion or $162 billion today with inflation over about 13 years. The Apollo program cost about $142 billion in today's dollars. Manned exploration is the most expensive space venture and consequently the most difficult for which to obtain political support, Cunningham said during his testimony. He added, according to Scientific American, unless the country, which is Congress here, decided to put more money in it, this is just talk that we're doing here. Referring to Mars missions and a return to the moon, Cunningham said, NASA's budget is way too low to do all the things that we've talked about. President Biden may or may not be in the office the next time NASA lands astronauts back on the moon in 2025 or later. And therein lies another major problem, partisan political whiplash. Why would you believe what any president said about the prediction of something that was going to happen to administrations in the future? Hadfield said, that's just talk. 
The process of designing, engineering, and testing a spacecraft that could get people to another world easily outlasts a two-term president, but incoming presidents and lawmakers often scrap the previous leader's space exploration priorities. I would like the next president to support the budget that allows us to accomplish the mission that we are asked to perform, whatever that mission may be. Scott Kelly, an astronaut who spent a year in space, wrote in a Reddit Ask Me Anything thread in January 2016 before Trump took office. But presidents and Congress don't often seem to care about staying on the course. In 2004, for example, the Bush administration tasked NASA with coming up with a way to replace the space shuttle which was set to retire and also return to the moon. The agency came up with the Constellation program to land astronauts on the moon using a rocket called Ares and a spaceship called Orion. NASA spent $9 billion over five years designing, building, and testing hardware for that human spaceflight program. Yet after President Barack Obama took office, and the Government Accountability Office released a report about NASA's inability to estimate Constellation's cost, Obama pushed to scrap the program and signed off on the SLS rocket instead. Trump didn't scrap SLS, but he did change Obama's goal of launching astronauts to an asteroid, shifting priorities to the moon and Mars missions. Trump wanted to see Artemis land astronauts back on the moon in 2024. Such frequent changes to NASA's expensive priorities have led to cancellation after cancellation, a loss of about $20 billion, and years of wasted time and momentum. Biden seems to be a rare exception to the shifty presidential trend. He hasn't toyed with Trump's Artemis priority for NASA, and he's also kept the Space Force intact. Buzz Aldrin said in a testimony to Congress in 2015 that he believes that the will to return to the moon must come from Capitol Hill. American leadership is inspiring the world by consistently doing what no other nation is capable of doing. We demonstrated that for a brief time 45 years ago. I do not believe we have done it since, Aldrin wrote in a statement. I believe it begins with bipartisan congressional and administration commitment to sustained leadership. The real driving force behind the government commitment to return to the moon is the will of the American people who vote for politicians and help shape their policy priorities. But public interest in lunar exploration has always been lukewarm. Even at the height of the Apollo program, after Aldrin and Neil Armstrong stepped onto the lunar surface, only 53% of Americans said they thought the program was worth the cost. Most of the rest of the time, U.S. approval of Apollo hovered below 50%. Most Americans think NASA should make returning to the moon a priority at this point. More than 57% of nationwide respondents to an insider poll in December 2018 said returning to the moon is an important goal for NASA. But only 38% said that living, breathing humans need to go back. Others who want the U.S. to land on the moon say robots could do the lunar exploring. Support for crewed Mars exploration is stronger. With 63% of respondents to a 2018 Pew Research Center poll saying it should be a NASA priority. Meanwhile, 91% think that scanning the skies for killer asteroids is important. The political back and forth over NASA's central goal and financial plan isn't the main explanation individuals haven't gotten back to the moon. The moon is likewise a 4.5 billion year old passing snare for people and should not be played with or misjudged. The moon's surface is covered with holes and stones and it undermines safe arrivals. But paving the way to the primary moon arrival in 1969, the U.S. government spent what might be billions in the present dollars to create, send off, and convey satellites to the moon to plan its surface and assist mission organizers with exploring for conceivable Apollo landing destinations. But the bigger worry is that aeons of meteorite impacts have created regolith, also called moon dust. Madhu Tanjavelu, an aeronautical engineer at the University of Southern California, wrote in 2014 that the moon is covered in a fine talc-like top layer of lunar dust, several inches deep in some regions, which is electrostatically charged through interaction with the solar wind and is very abrasive and clingy, fouling up spacesuits, vehicles, and systems very quickly. Peggy Whitson, an astronaut who lived in space for a total of 665 days, previously told Business Insider that the Apollo missions had a lot of problems with dust. 
if we're going to spend long durations and build permanent habitats, we have to figure out how to handle that, Whitson said.